In a world disfigured by the bloody skirmishes of World War I, the idea of a space race seemed laughable. Who could dream of stars when the Earth itself was an open wound? But sometimes, humanity's hubris knows no bounds. The time was the early 1920s, just a few years after the Treaty of Versailles had officially ended the war. A curious rumor circulated among the intellectual circles there existed a group of men, mostly scientists and politicians, who believed that the key to defeating enemies lay not in trenches but among the stars. They called themselves the Cosmic Crusaders. The name seemed as foolish as their aim. August 17, 1921. The Great Hall of a once majestic mansion, now tarnished by war, played host to this clandestine gathering. Gathered were Sir Harold Wimpleton, a British aristocrat with no scientific background but with too much money, Dr. Jeremiah Ostwald, an American engineer known for misquoting Newton, and General Boris Valentinovich, a Russian military man with a passion for astrology. They met under the feeble light of an oil lamp, shadows dancing around them like malevolent spirits. Imagine the horror the utter shock, when we descend from the heavens onto our enemies. Wimpleton exclaimed, sipping his wine, a concoction as muddy as his thinking. We'll be like gods. Ostwald nodded vigorously, spilling ink from his lapel pocket. Precisely. Why fight for land when you can conquer space? And think of the resources, chimed in Valentinovich, misinterpreting the rings of Saturn as potential gold mines. They decided that each country would focus on one particular challenge. The British, with their expertise in naval operations, would work on the aquatic concerns how to sustain water supply in space. The Americans, known for their mechanical prowess, would tackle the rocket's engine. The Russians, with their harsh winters, would focus on insulating the spacecraft against extreme cold. Months went by, each country laboriously working on its tasks. As one would expect, given their collective ineptitude, mistakes were numerous, consequences severe, but lessons were never learned. The British team attempted to develop a water filtration system by replicating the ebb and flow of tides in a tank. Naturally, their contraption looked more like a drowning chamber, and during a test run, it did just that drowned three lab rats and flooded the lab. In the United States, Ostwald was adamant that the power of steam, the same force that propelled locomotives, could launch a rocket into space. After much tinkering, he had a prototype essentially a boiler strapped to metal tubes. The test flight incinerated upon liftoff, creating a spectacle that was quite a hit among the local townsfolk but causing a minor forest fire in the process. Meanwhile, Valentinovich decided that bare fur would be an excellent insulator against the freezing temperatures of space. He ordered the pelts of a hundred Siberian bears to be sewn into the internal lining of the spacecraft. When the prototype was tested in a simulated cold chamber, the fur ignited and the whole thing went up in flames, giving a whole new meaning to the term Russian bear. Unbeknownst to them, news of their spectacular failures had attracted public attention, not out of awe but out of a perverse fascination with the absurdity of it all. It became a circus, a theater of the grotesque where everyone knew the ending would be tragic. But no one could look away. The day arrived for the joint test launch. The contraption, pieced together from each country's ill-conceived designs, was a monstrosity. It stood on the launch pad, steam hissing from its sides and bare fur flapping in the wind. A dog named Hero, chosen for its expendability rather than any intrinsic heroic quality, was strapped inside the cockpit, if it could be called that. The world watched, collectively holding its breath, not in anticipation but in dread. Wimpleton, Ostwald, and Valentinovich stood next to each other, foolish grins stretching across their faces. They genuinely believed that this monstrosity would pierce the heavens and redefine warfare. Oblivious to their profound ignorance, they counted down. 3, 2, 1, ignite. The explosion was heard for miles, 
a cacophonous symphony of man's folly. What remained of the rocket was a smoldering pile of debris, twisted metal, and burnt bare fur. Hero, thankfully, had been freed by a lab assistant who couldn't bear the thought of senseless animal cruelty. As the smoke cleared, the weight of their failure should have descended upon them. But it didn't. What a magnificent display! Wimpleton exclaimed, still cradling his wine glass, which miraculously remained intact. A minor hiccup. Ostwald agreed, scribbling illegible equations onto his notepad. We will learn from this, Valentinovich said, already planning the next disaster. But the world had seen enough. Finally recognizing the project's absurdity, governments pulled their support, leaving the Cosmic Crusaders as a cautionary tale in the annals of scientific history. It was an endeavor that was doomed from the start, a monument to the staggering overreach of ambition devoid of wisdom. A long, drawn-out procession of failures, each more preposterous than the last, that managed to unite the world, not in a shared vision of celestial grandeur, but in collective horror and ridicule. And so, in this twisted timeline, the space race became not a symbol of humanity's potential, but a grim testament to its limitations, forever etching the futility of hubris in the cosmic order. Somewhere in the heavens, among the very stars they had so naively hoped to conquer, the universe must have been laughing. Unfathomably, the world's morbid fascination with the cosmic crusaders didn't wane. The farcical calamity had been so grand, so absurdly spectacular, that society deemed it entertainment a circus of scientific idiocy, if you will. As such, wealthy patrons, perhaps even more foolish than our heroes, decided to fund the next phase of this doomed endeavor. Wimpleton, Ostwald, and Valentinovich convened once more, this time in a lavish hotel suite. The setting was incongruously elegant, the glinting chandelier overhead a stark contrast to the buffoonery that was about to unfold. We must consider the atmosphere, said Wimpleton, circling a globe that was actually a repurposed bowling ball. A balloon could lift the rocket through the first few miles, like an appetizer before the main course. Ostwald, inspired by Wimpleton's balloon idea, piped up, indeed, and instead of steam, let's use fireworks to propel the rocket. It's both functional and visually appealing. Brilliant. Valentinovich slapped the table. And instead of bare fur, we shall use a vodka cooling system for insulation. Cold vodka for a cold universe. And so, they set to work their confidence inexplicably bolstered by their previous disaster. In the rolling hills of England, Wimpleton experimented with hot air balloons. Yet, instead of using hydrogen or helium, he insisted that methane the gas he equated with natural British robustness would do the trick. Onlookers watched in bemusement as a flatulent cow, connected via tubes to the balloon, attempted to fill it with gas. The result was less uplifting and more combustible, the pasture was eventually sectioned off as a biohazard zone. Across the pond, Ostwald, inspired by the 4th of July, attempted to launch a prototype using industrial-grade fireworks. With a lack of understanding that could only be described as magical, he believed the colors of the explosions would somehow impact the speed of the rocket. Red for passion, blue for intellect and white for purity. A patriotic ascent to the heavens, he proclaimed. The ensuing explosion could be heard from three states away and left a crater the size of a football field. Ostwald was not disheartened, he just assumed they'd reached a new world and named the crater Ostwaldia. As for Valentinovich, the vodka cooling system was an unmitigated, yet predictable, disaster. Lab technicians got drunk vodka spills led to small fires, and the only thing that got launched were impromptu Russian folk dances. Months later, the new rocket more a Frankenstein's monster of delusion than a vehicle was ready. Christened the spirit of folly, it stood tall, wobbling slightly under the weight of its own absurdity. Wimpleton's methane-filled balloons were attached to its sides, 
Ostwald's fireworks were crammed into the base, and Valentinovica's vodka cooling system was installed, complete with shot glasses. The trio donned ridiculous costumes for the occasion, Wimpleton wore a knight's armor, Ostwald sported a lab coat covered in scribbled equations, and Valentinovich dressed as a Cossack complete with a fur hat. The crowd watched in a state of gleeful anticipation, fully aware of the calamity that was about to ensue. With all the misplaced solemnity of launching a real scientific endeavor, they commenced the countdown. 3, 2, 1. The first firework exploded, lifting the rocket a meager foot off the ground before a second firework shot it sideways. The methane balloons, catching fire from the fireworks, exploded in sequence like a string of disastrous Christmas lights. The vodka cooling system sprung a leak, showering the burning wreckage in high-proof spirits, fueling an inferno that would be talked about for generations. As the crowd erupted into both laughter and applause, the cosmic crusaders stood there, staring at their latest disaster, their faces ashen but not without a glint of twisted accomplishment. Remarkable, said Wimpleton, his armor singed but his spirit unbreakable. A resounding success in terms of entertainment. Ostwald noted, ever the optimist. We have warmed the earth with our burning desires, Valentinovich said, misinterpreting the literal flames around them as metaphorical ones. As the fire department rushed in to douse the blazing remains of the spirit of folly, the crowd could hardly contain their laughter and awe. There were no casualties, miraculously, but dignity and common sense had long since been abandoned, anyway. The cosmic crusaders were not deterred, they gathered in their meeting room, smoke-stained but resolute. A pile of telegrams from their so-called patrons lay on the table, each more absurd than the last. One suggested using rubber bands for propulsion, another wondered if the lack of horseshoes had jinxed their rocket's fortune. The letters were ridiculous, but the men read each one as if they were scholars examining ancient scrolls. Ah, listen to this. Ostwald beamed, holding up a telegram. Have you considered a rocket made entirely of marshmallows to cushion any potential impact? Brilliant. Valentinovich, taking a break from jotting down a rough design for a new vodka-powered jetpack, looked up and nodded. Duh, marshmallows. In Russia, we say, when life gives you marshmallows, make rocket. Wimpleton twirled his mustache in thought. Intriguing. The light, fluffy nature of marshmallows could also provide insulation against the harsh cold of space. It's like wool, but edible. Despite the consistent failures, more money poured in. Society was morbidly fascinated by these men buffoons, perhaps, but entertaining buffoons. The crusaders were given a new, larger budget to play with. Investors, politicians, and even some celebrities found the whole charade too entertaining to allow it to stop. Months of preparation went into their new project. Wimpleton was in charge of the marshmallow insulation, it took him weeks to realize that marshmallows melt under intense heat. The initial tests left the test chamber smelling like a burnt s'more. Ostwald, inspired by the myth of Icarus, insisted that they could use feathers to give the rocket the gift of bird-like flight. He spent an absurd amount of time collecting feathers from a variety of birds, convinced that each type would bestow a different aerodynamic property. Valentinovich, not to be outdone, thought that in addition to vodka cooling, the rocket should have a vodka propulsion system. The mechanism was designed to literally shoot vodka out of the back of the rocket to propel it forward. The first test only served to create an impressive fireball that attracted local media attention. Yet, like moths to a flame, the men and their growing number of followers were drawn back to the launch pad for another attempt. The rocket now was an amalgamation of absurdity, wrapped in marshmallows, lined with feathers, and fitted with a vodka propulsion system that nobody understood but everyone approved of. People of Earth, Wimpleton announced, standing before a microphone as television cameras broadcast the impending debacle worldwide, today, 
we climb the stairs of heaven on a path laid by marshmallows, feathers, and Mother Russia's finest vodka. The countdown began, and the world held its collective breath some in anticipation, most in disbelief. 3, 2, 1. The vodka propulsion system ignited, sending a plume of flame into the sky but barely lifting the rocket an inch. Then the marshmallow insulation caught fire, creating a surreal spectacle of floating, flaming marshmallows. The feathers, now set ablaze, fluttered away from the rocket like embers from a bonfire, creating an ash cloud that left the onlookers in a state of stupefied wonder. Astoundingly, the rocket began to rise. Slowly, ever so slowly, it ascended, carried aloft more by the flaming mess than any semblance of scientific ingenuity. But rise it did 20 feet, then 50, before plummeting back to earth in a fiery arc, landing in a nearby pond with a loud sizzle and a plume of steam. The cosmic crusaders looked at each other, then at the spectacle they had created. A stunned silence fell over the crowd before erupting into raucous laughter and applause. Yet again, they had failed in the most spectacular fashion, and yet again, the world was inexplicably enchanted. Gentlemen, said Wimpleton, wiping a sooty tear from his eye, I think we've created a new kind of art. A testimony to human imagination, albeit misapplied. It's science, Ostwald corrected, but not as we know it. It's science as it ought to be incomprehensible, unpredictable, and utterly, irrevocably ludicrous. Valentinovich raised a bottle of vodka, now half empty. To failure, the mother of success, and to us the forever failing but never faltering cosmic crusaders. And so, they toasted, and the world toasted with them. The spectacle was far from over, there were still so many wrongs to make right, so many more idiocies to explore. The absurdity of the endeavor became its own form of success, a laughing stock turned cultural phenomenon, and the cosmic crusaders reveled in it. They never reached space, they never even got close. But they reached something perhaps even more elusive, a pinnacle of collective folly that transcended nationality, intelligence, and common sense. The timeline had been irrevocably skewed, marked indelibly by this band of likable imbeciles and their ludicrous quest for the heavens. They hadn't changed the world, but they had given it something almost as valuable a reason to laugh at the absurdity of human endeavor. Valentinovich slapped his forehead dramatically, nearly upending his bottle of vodka. Airplanes. Duh, how could we forget? Why are we trying to reinvent wheel when wheel is already in sky? Wimpleton's eyes lit up, twirling his soot-blackened mustache with renewed vigor. By Jove, you're correct. We've been foolishly fixated on rockets when we could simply modify existing airplanes to reach space. Ostwald scratched his head, bewildered. Wait, wait, wait. Are you suggesting that we essentially tape some rockets onto an airplane and call it a spacecraft? Wimpleton nodded eagerly. Exactly. But not just any rockets firework rockets. After all, they are designed to go up, and that's precisely what we need. Valentinovich pulled out his notepad and started scribbling hastily. Okay, so we attach firework rockets all over airplane on wings, on tail, under seats for extra boost. Ostwald clapped his hands together, already imagining the spectacle. And for propulsion, let's use a combination of helium balloons and more vodka. The team feverishly got to work, sourcing a battered biplane from a local airfield, ostensibly for scientific modifications. Word spread, and once again, the world prepared for a spectacle that promised to be ludicrously entertaining. Within days, the old biplane was transformed or disfigured, depending on your perspective into a monstrosity adorned with firework rockets, helium balloons, and vodka-powered thrusters. The cosmic crusaders even attached giant rubber bands to the propellers, convinced it would provide maximum lift. The day of the new launch arrived, and the crowd was bigger than ever. The biplane was wheeled onto the launch pad amidst a sea of laughter and incredulity. 
It looked less like a scientific endeavor and more like a carnival float gone terribly wrong. People of Earth, Wimpleton once again took the stage, prepare to witness a marvel of human ingenuity. We shall ascend the heavens not in a rocket, but in this this beautiful bird of mankind's making. Valentinovich lit a comically large fuse connected to the firework rockets, then dashed to the cockpit, barely making it inside before the fuse reached its end. The firework rockets ignited, sending plumes of colored smoke and sparks in all directions, causing the crowd to cheer and applaud the dazzling display. However, instead of lifting off, the biplane started spinning erratically on the ground, fireworks shooting off in every conceivable direction, turning the launch pad into a frenzied dance of light and fire. The helium balloons popped one by one, each with a cartoonish pop that sent the crowd into fits of laughter. The vodka thrusters ignited as well, creating a series of mini fireballs that made the plane look like a dragon suffering from acute indigestion. Finally, the rubber bands snapped, causing the propellers to fly off and land somewhere in the distant crowd, who had now erupted into uproarious laughter. The biplane made a sound that could only be described as a wheeze before collapsing in on itself, reduced to a smoldering heap of metal, wood, and deflated dreams. The cosmic crusaders exited the wreckage, each blackened by soot but beaming like children who had just put on the greatest show on Earth. Wimpleton took off his top hat, now adorned with singed feathers and melted marshmallow, and bowed dramatically. Ladies and gentlemen, he proclaimed, we may not have reached the stars today, but we've certainly entertained them. The crowd roared its approval, showering the men with applause and, oddly enough, marshmallows. The crusaders had failed spectacularly again, yet their contagious enthusiasm and uncanny ability to turn disaster into spectacle had once more won the day. As they retreated from the launch pad, already brainstorming their next fantastically ill-advised venture, one thing became abundantly clear, they may never reach space, but the cosmic crusaders had certainly found a special place in the annals of human folly and the hearts of a public that couldn't get enough of their delightful idiocy. The members of the cosmic crusaders huddled around the charred remains of their biplane, gazing intently as if divining some mystical truth from the wreckage. Wimpleton straightened up, shaking off the ash that coated his once pristine suit. Gentlemen, it's clear as crystal. The rockets were an unnecessary complication. The airplane can fly, so let's let it fly. Straight up. Valentinovica's eyes widened in realization, his brain buzzing like a short-circuiting radio. Straight up. Why we never think of that. We make airplane go horizontal all time. Vertical is just horizontal turned 90 degrees. Ostwald face palmed so hard it echoed like a gunshot. Of course. And if we want it to go really high, we just need to accelerate really fast. Like a bumblebee rising to meet the sun. A mad glint shone in Wimpleton's eyes. Ah, but not just any acceleration maximum acceleration. We'll install a nitrous oxide system. Just like the ones in those street racing automobiles. Valentinovich stood up. So inspired he started to recite impromptu poetry. Rocket is square, but plane is fair, we'll fly straight up and breathe cosmic air. Determined more than ever, the cosmic crusaders somehow managed to find another biplane willing to sacrifice itself for aeronautical pioneering. Armed with cans of nitrous oxide stolen ahem, borrowed from a local dentist's office, and a piloting manual they had found in a children's library, the team felt prepared for their next adventure. On launch day, the crowd returned, their numbers doubled, each person keen to witness the next chapter in this unfolding epic of folly. The Crusaders wheeled out the newly upgraded biplane, now equipped with a makeshift nitrous oxide injection system crudely welded into the engine and a giant lever in the cockpit labeled Go Fast Now. Wimpleton ascended the makeshift stage created from empty vodka barrels and broken dreams. Ladies and gentlemen. Today, we dispense with the smoke and mirrors, the fireworks and folly. Today, 
we soar into the heavens under our own power. Prepare to be dazzled as we fly straight up into the great unknown. Valentinovich, who was given the honor of piloting this attempt, clambered into the cockpit, his face a picture of sheer determination. With a theatrical flourish, he pulled the lever to its maximum position. The engine roared to life, louder than ever before, fueled by the nitrous oxide now flooding its cylinders. For a split second, the plane actually lifted a foot off the ground, and the crowd held its collective breath. And then, with a sound like a tuba being stepped on by an elephant, the engine exploded. Car parts, cans of nitrous oxide, and what appeared to be a rubber duck flew in all directions. But remarkably, the cockpit remained intact, and Valentinovich emerged, singed but smiling. Ah, we have lift off, he exclaimed, ignoring the fact that they had only lifted off from pieces of their own aircraft. Wimbledon, running toward him, threw his arms up in triumph. You see. A complete success. We've mastered vertical ascension, albeit briefly. Ostwald, who had been knocked over by the flying rubber duck, got up and dusted himself off. Gentlemen, we're making undeniable progress. The sky or rather, the few feet above the ground is no longer the limit. As they looked over the crowd, who were alternating between fits of laughter and genuine applause, the cosmic crusaders felt a renewed sense of purpose. They had flown straight up into disaster once more, but their infatible spirit soared ever higher. Yes, my friends, we've had setbacks, Wimbledon began, rallying his comrades and the crowd. But remember, each failure is but a stepping stone on the stairway to the stars. And so, we shall return, with ever grander plans and even more audacious stupidity. We shall not rest until we've conquered the heavens or entertained you trying. And so, with an irrepressible sense of misguided destiny, the cosmic crusaders began planning their next spectacularly ill-fated attempt to touch the sky. And though they hadn't reached space, they had indeed become legends, each a hero in their own fantastically idiotic way. Ostwald, who had spent the night reading a pop-up book about aerodynamics, had a eureka moment in the middle of breakfast. Gentlemen. I've got it. If we want to go up, we need more, upness. Valentinovich nearly choked on his morning vodka. Upness? Ah, you mean like balloons. Wimbledon's eyes widened, lighting up like a child who had just discovered the cookie jar. Not just any balloons. Hot air balloons. They're designed to go up. We've been fools, my dear comrades fools. Ostwald stood up, knocking over his chair in excitement. Yes. Yes. If we attach a dozen hot air balloons to the biplane, we'll create a veritable airship. So, the Cosmic Crusaders set out on their new mission, Operation Upness. Using a series of ropes, pulleys, and a great deal of duct tape, they attached 12 hot air balloons to their latest biplane, which had somehow survived their previous escapades. We shall name her, the Ascendant Imbecile, declared Wimbledon, spraying a bottle of champagne over the contraption, though most of it ended up soaking Valentinovich. And for power, we use coal furnace. Valentinovich chipped in. More fire, more upness. The team rigged up a coal furnace positioning it precariously between the balloons and the biplane. They filled it with as much coal as it could handle, stoking the flames until they roared like a dragon with indigestion. The day of the launch was upon them. An even larger crowd had gathered, word having spread that the Cosmic Crusaders were attempting something unprecedented in the annals of idiocy. People of Earth, Wimbledon once more took the makeshift stage, prepare for a true marvel. The ascendant imbecile will not merely fly, it will ascend, breaking the very bonds of Earth's gravity with its upness. Valentinovich, draped in a scarf that trailed behind him like a comet's tail, was the designated pilot again. Ostwald handed him a coal shovel. For maximum upness. With a flourish, Valentinovich pulled on a rope that released the balloons. Slowly, 
Awkwardly, the ascendant imbecile began to rise. The crowd owed and awed, captivated by this majestic dance of heat, height, and haplessness. However, just as it seemed that they might actually achieve some semblance of upness, disaster struck. The heat from the coal furnace ignited one of the balloons. It popped with a deafening bang, causing the entire contraption to lurch violently to one side. Then, as if in a chain reaction of imbecility, the furnace tipped over, spilling burning coal onto the remaining balloons. One by one, they popped, each explosion sending the ascendant imbecile spinning like a malfunctioning carousel. Finally, with a resounding crash, it hit the ground, a tangled mess of ropes, fabric, wood, and thanks to the coal furnace smoldering embers. Valentinovich emerged from the wreckage, his scarf now a mere stub of its former self, but his spirit undeterred. We had upness. Briefly, but we had it. Wimpleton dashed toward him, clapping him on the back with glee. An astounding success. We've never been that vertically mobile before. Clearly, we're on the right track. Ostwald, who was trying to untangle himself from a mess of ropes and balloons, finally broke free. Gentlemen, our journey to the stars is like climbing a ladder. A very long, rickety, and potentially flammable ladder, but a ladder nonetheless. The crowd erupted in cheers and laughter, throwing roses and confetti at the trio, who took a bow, basking in the glory of their latest magnificent failure. As long as there are stars in the sky and ground to crash into, we shall continue our quest for upness. Wimpleton proclaimed, sweeping his arm dramatically towards the heavens. And so, the cosmic crusaders, those indomitable avatars of asininity, returned to their drawing board, undeterred and as clueless as ever. For in their hearts burned a fire no amount of failure could extinguish a fire of pure, unadulterated idiocy that promised to fuel many more adventures, each more ludicrous than the last. The years rolled on like a boulder down a mountain unstoppable, inevitable, and utterly crushing anything in its path, including common sense. Despite their spectacular record of mishaps, the Cosmic Crusaders only gained more supporters, who were either there for the laughter or genuinely believed in the trio's indefatigable spirit. The Spherical Strategy, 1931 We've been approaching this all wrong, Ostwald proclaimed one day, flipping through an almanac of obscure facts. According to Archimedes, a sphere has the least surface area. Ergo, we must become spherical. Valentinovich scratched his head. Like bowling ball. Exactly. Wimpleton said, clapping his hands together. We'll encase ourselves in a metal sphere and roll our way to space. Operation Spherical Strategy was born. Using leftover scrap metal from a defunct railway project, the Crusaders built a gigantic sphere, installed some rudimentary seats inside, and filled the bottom with what they thought was rocket fuel but was actually moonshine. On the day of the launch, the crowd was so large it caused a traffic jam for miles. Valentinovich climbed into the sphere while Ostwald and Wimpleton gave speeches about the geometry of greatness. The sphere rocked violently upon ignition, moving sideways rather than upwards. It crashed through the crowd, bowling over tents and kiosks before splashing into a nearby pond, sinking immediately. Valentinovich emerged, gasping for air but grinning from ear to ear. We achieved lateral upness. A new direction. The Magnificent Magnet, 1947. Invisible forces propel the universe. Ostwald declared during their weekly meeting, now conducted in a shed to prevent any more accidental fires. We will harness magnetism. They created a ship laden with supercharged magnets, believing the repelling forces would lift them into space. Sadly, the only thing it attracted was every metal object within a five-mile radius. On launch day, instead of ascending to the heavens, the magnificent magnet became a horrific amalgamation of bicycles, mailboxes, kitchen appliances, and a bewildered donkey wearing a horseshoe. It was a spectacle of chaos that took weeks to untangle. 
Ostwald, however, remained optimistic. Ah, the donkey is a symbol of perseverance in many cultures. A clear sign we must carry on. Operation Hot Potato, 1955. We're complicating things, Wimpleton sighed. Space is cold, yes? What do we know that's hot? Valentinovich snapped his fingers. Potato. Their next plan involved a giant potato-shaped ship filled with boiling water. The theory was that the steam would propel them upwards. The result was a culinary disaster. The potato exploded upon ignition, showering the audience with mashed potatoes. It was the most delicious of their failures but did nothing to advance their cosmic ambitions. Potatoes are for eating, not for flying, Wimpleton admitted. But we fed the audience, therefore, it's a win. The Vacuum Vortex, 1959. As the real space race was ramping up, the Cosmic Crusaders felt they couldn't be left behind. Wimpleton had a thought. If space is a vacuum, then surely a vacuum can take us to space. They attached dozens of household vacuum cleaners to a wooden frame, convinced that the suction would defy gravity. During the launch, the vacuums did turn on, sucking up grass, dirt, and small animals, but never achieving liftoff. Instead, they created a small but incredibly dirty tornado that lasted about three minutes before collapsing. Valentinovich looked at the tornado's aftermath and chuckled. We may not have cleaned up our act, but we certainly cleaned up the lawn. As the 1950s came to a close, the world watched in awe as actual rockets, piloted by well-trained astronauts and cosmonauts, broke through Earth's atmosphere and ventured into space. Meanwhile, the cosmic crusaders still failed to reach the heavens, but their spirits remained as high as ever. For them, every absurd, spectacular, comedic failure was a step forward or at least, a step in some kind of direction. Undeterred, they carried their flag of idiocy into the 1960s, ready to misunderstand and misuse every scientific advancement the new decade would bring. After all, if there was one thing that could withstand the test of time, it was their unparalleled ability to fail upwards or sidewards, or downwards, or in whatever orientation their latest harebrained scheme took them. As the 1950s shifted into the 1960s, a very different kind of space race began to evolve one that actually involved rockets capable of reaching the atmosphere, rather than vacuums and potato ships. NASA was founded in 1958, aiming to pioneer the future in space exploration and aeronautics research. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union launched its own space program, ushering in an era of real scientific advancements and space exploration. The Cosmic Crusaders watched these developments with keen interest and a complete misunderstanding of their implications. The founding of NASA, 1958. Ostwald, Wimpleton, and Valentinovich gathered in their makeshift lab, which was basically a garage filled with useless contraptions and rubber ducks for buoyancy experiments. Chaps, I hear the Americans have founded a new space organization NASA, they call it, Ostwald announced, mangling the acronym horribly. Stands for no actual science allowed, no doubt. Wimpleton chuckled. What do you expect from a country that uses inches and feet? Clearly, they're behind in the great cosmic race. Valentinovich nodded vigorously. Duh, I hear Soviets also stepping up. They are planning to send man to space. We must beat them. The Russians launch Sputnik, 1957. When the Soviets successfully launched Sputnik into orbit around Earth, most people saw it as a groundbreaking event that symbolized the dawn of a new era. The Cosmic Crusaders saw it as a personal insult. A satellite? That's their big accomplishment. Wimpleton scoffed as they read the news. We've been sending things into the sky for decades. Granted, they don't stay there, but still. Ostwald shook his head dismissively. It's nothing but a glorified tin can. Our next project will outshine this Sputnik. 
The Cosmic Crusaders vs NASA, Operation Bovine Ascendancy, 1961 As NASA worked tirelessly to put a man into space, the Cosmic Crusaders decided to take a different approach send a cow into space. After all, cows had bovinely balanced bodies ideal for the cosmos or so they claimed. Operation Bovine Ascendancy was a spectacle of absurdity. A cow was hoisted into a barrel-shaped contraption with a massive slingshot aimed skywards. On the day of the launch, they invited local media, claiming that they would be the first to put a living being into space. The cow was launched, and for a few seconds, it looked like it might actually work. Then gravity took over, and the cow descended, landing in a field of haystacks unharmed but bewildered. NASA engineers, hearing about the stunt, couldn't help but mock the Crusaders. Moving experience, wasn't it, they jested. The Soviet space program also joined in, releasing a statement, Cosmic Crusaders, please leave space exploration to experts. You are making our propaganda too easy. The space race continues, mid-1960s. Despite continuous mockery from actual space agencies, the Cosmic Crusaders refused to back down. Our ideas are ahead of their time. Ostwald declared. Someday they'll see. We'll have the last laugh. Valentinovich pounded his fist on a table cluttered with blueprints for an ill-conceived windmill rocket. Duh. We will beat NASA and Soviets with ingenuity. Wimpleton, usually the more sensible of the three, suddenly had an epiphany. Gentlemen, if we can't beat them into space, why not dig our way to the other side of the Earth to claim victory? The other two paused, looked at each other, and broke into uproarious laughter. Ah, Wimpleton, that's absurd even for us. Ostwald said, wiping a tear from his eye. But, as they say, the sky's the limit, even if we can't quite reach it. So, as NASA and the Soviet space program made leaps and bounds in the realm of space exploration, the Cosmic Crusaders continued to stumble and fall, blissfully ignorant of their ignorance. Yet their indomitable spirit, fueled by a delusional sense of achievement, made them a never-ending source of comedy for the world and an eternal thorn in the side of actual science. The Great Skyward Propeller Plan, Late 1960s As NASA and the Soviet Union took their rivalry to the moon, the Cosmic Crusaders were still stuck on Earth quite literally. But Ostwald had a new brainwave, something he called the Skyward Propeller Plan. Gentlemen, you've heard of helicopters, yes? They use propellers to lift into the sky. What if we made an exceptionally large propeller? Wimbledon stroked his chin thoughtfully. Hmm. If small propellers can lift a machine, imagine what an enormously massive, gigantic, humongous, and dare I say gargantuan propeller could do. Valentinovich was already sketching. Duh. With large enough propeller, we can not just reach space but cut moon in half. Claim peace for ourselves. The trio set to work. What resulted was a monstrosity of a contraption, a propeller so large it wouldn't even spin. After considerable struggle, they somehow managed to set it upright in the middle of a field. The launch day. The Crusaders invited media outlets once again, and this time, they wore matching overalls with their team name stitched on the back. They were confident that today, they would write history. After a grandiose and largely incoherent speech by Ostwald about the theoretical physics of propellerology, Valentinovich pulled a giant lever. The propeller groaned, creaked, and collapsed onto itself. Far from taking anyone to the moon, it didn't even manage to stir a light breeze. Fortunately, the only casualty was a scarecrow in the neighboring field, which was decapitated by a flying propeller blade. The world laughed. NASA snickered, and even the Soviets found it amusing. Yet the Cosmic Crusaders remained undeterred. The ignorance is rocket fuel philosophy, early 1970s. As Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon and uttered his iconic words, the Cosmic Crusaders were holding an emergency meeting. 
We're being left behind, gentlemen. People have walked on the moon, and we haven't even left the atmosphere. Ostwald lamented. Wimbledon, ever the optimist, chuckled. My dear Ostwald, you're missing the point. They may have rockets, but we have something far more powerful, ignorance. Valentinovich jumped up. Ignorance is like rocket fuel for imagination. No limitations. And so, as the world made genuine strides in space exploration, the cosmic crusaders kept launching their ill-conceived projects, from trying to catapult themselves using a giant slingshot to building a submarine spaceship hybrid that was neither watertight nor airtight. They became the jesters of the scientific community, a cautionary tale in engineering classrooms, and a punchline at conferences. Yet their enthusiasm never wavered. If anything, each failure seemed to bolster their resolve, making them even more endearing symbols of misguided ambition. So, while NASA and the Soviet space program raced toward the stars, the cosmic crusaders remained grounded foolishly, hilariously, and quite stubbornly so. And they were more than okay with it. After all, they genuinely believed they were making progress, one ridiculous failure at a time. The Yuri Gagarin Affair, Early 1970s In this alternate timeline, the Soviet Union finally achieved the feat of sending a man into space in the early 1970s. Yuri Gagarin's name echoed through history, as he circled Earth and returned safely. But instead of seeing this as an accomplishment for mankind, the Cosmic Crusaders took it personally. Stolen. Our precious data has been stolen. Ostwald declared dramatically, clutching a roll of toilet paper on which he had doodled rocket designs. That Gagarin fellow couldn't have possibly achieved orbit without our highly sophisticated calculations. Wimbledon nodded vigorously, his eyes wide. Absolutely. Those Soviets must have bugged our headquarters, which, as we know, is a temple of scientific progress. Valentinovich was furious. How dare they? I have always suspected my third cousin twice removed on my mother's side, who lives near Siberia, is a KGB spy. He must have passed on our precious intel. The is Stolen Data Conference, mid-1970s. Infuriated and feeling wronged, the Cosmic Crusaders organized a press conference to declare that their intellectual property had been robbed by the Soviets. Dressed in foil hats to prevent further espionage, they presented their case. Our designs for the Bubble Wrap 1, a spacecraft made entirely of bubble wrap for optimal comfort and safety, were blatantly copied by the Russians. Ostwald claimed, unrolling a piece of parchment with childlike sketches. As you can see, Wimpleton added, pointing at a stick figure floating inside a bubble, our designs are revolutionary. And the Soviets had the audacity to replace our bubble wrap with metal and actual science. Valentinovich took over for the finale. We demand recognition. Gagarin's journey was standing on the shoulders of our intellectual might. The world's reaction, still the 1970s. The news was met with laughter from all corners of the Earth. NASA officially responded with a simple, the only thing the cosmic crusaders have launched into the atmosphere is comedy. Even the Soviet space program couldn't help but joke about it. Thank you, cosmic crusaders, for providing endless entertainment. Your contribution to space travel is invaluable. Despite all this, the Cosmic Crusaders were far from discouraged. If anything, they felt vindicated. This just proves that we're a threat to their operations. They can't handle our advanced methods of trial and lots of error. Ostwald asserted. And so, they continued to plot and plan, sketch and scheme. Though their idiocy was unmatched, so was their persistence. In their minds, they were pioneers, misunderstood geniuses whose day in the interstellar sun would surely come. It didn't matter that the rest of the world viewed them as little more than comic relief. In the unfathomable reaches of their ignorance, 
they were legends gallantly marching backward into the future, one ludicrous failure at a time. The indignant outburst, mid-1970s. Not long after their stolen data conference, the Cosmic Crusaders convened another press conference, this time to air their grievances. They stepped up to the podium, visibly agitated, wrapped in tin foil cloaks as anti-espionage measures. Ostwald cleared his throat, looking around as if expecting Spice to jump out of the bushes at any moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had enough of being the laughing stock of the scientific community. Wimbledon interjected, we've been in this field since the 1920s, people. The 1920s. That's five decades of groundbreaking research and revolutionary failure. Valentinovich slammed his fist on the podium. Why, when we are the pioneers, do you all mock us? Yet you clearly piggyback on our work. We had the first bubble wrap spacecraft, the first skyward propeller, and don't get me started on our anti-gravity trampolines. The world's continued reaction, still mid-1970s. Unsurprisingly, the conference was met with even more laughter and disbelief. Major newspapers ran headlines like, Cosmic Crusaders claim they're the real space pioneers, Universe disagrees. NASA's spokesperson quipped, We'd like to extend our gratitude to the Cosmic Crusaders for their ongoing comedic services to humanity during these tense times of space exploration. The Soviets, too, chimed in. If the Cosmic Crusaders were the first, then we sincerely worry for the future of science and intellect. Unwavering ignorance, late 1970s. But the Cosmic Crusaders remain steadfast in their alternate reality. This is nothing but a mass conspiracy to discredit us. Ostwald declared during a team meeting held inside their shed, which they referred to as their research and innovation dome. Wimbledon nodded sagely. Clearly, the world isn't ready for our avant-garde approach to science. Or rather, science, as I call it science mixed with sheer ignorance. Valentinovich beamed. The greater they mock us, the closer we are to our inevitable breakthrough. One day, they will see. And so, despite universal ridicule and proven scientific realities suggesting otherwise, the cosmic crusaders continued their pursuits with unyielding, laughable determination. They had built an impervious wall of ignorance around themselves a wall so thick, not even the hard facts of their repeated failures could penetrate it. To the outside world, they were bumbling fools chasing the impossible. But in the depths of their delusion, they remained heroes of their own tragicomedy, forever convinced that they were the true pioneers destined to conquer the cosmos no matter how absurd that notion was to everyone else. The Legal Folly, Late 1970s Feeling egregiously slighted and genuinely believing they had a case, the Cosmic Crusaders decided to take legal action against NASA. They enlisted the help of their longtime associate, Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, who was not actually a lawyer but had watched many episodes of legal dramas on television. We demand reparation for the gross defamation and mockery we've suffered at the hands of NASA. Ostwald announced during yet another self-organized press conference. This time, they sported tinfoil suits complete with tinfoil briefcases to signify the gravity of the situation. Wimbledon, armed with a legal pad scribbled with nonsensical doodles and pseudo-legal jargon, added, we have strong evidence that our intellectual property has been stolen, mocked, and discredited by NASA. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, donning a cape made from a shower curtain for added dramatic effect, proclaimed, this case will be the trial of the century. Justice will be served, hot and fresh. NASA's response, still late 1970s. NASA could scarcely believe the audacity. Their official response was a succinct, this suit is as baseless as the Cosmic Crusader's understanding of physics. We look forward to an expedient dismissal of their claims. Legal experts around the country were amused. Renowned law professors cited the case in their lectures as an example of how not to use the legal system. The courtroom comedy, 
early 1980s. The case somehow found its way to a court docket, more out of amusement than any legal merit. The judge, jury, and onlookers couldn't contain their laughter as Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson attempted to present their case. Your Honor, Johnson began, waving a roll of tin foil as evidence, these noble pioneers have been maliciously maligned. I present Exhibit A, a tin foil hat which we believe NASA sought to sabotage by emitting mind-altering frequencies. Despite the comedy show they were inadvertently providing, the judge finally lost patience. Case dismissed. And for the love of sanity, please let this be the last we hear of space exploration from the Cosmic Crusaders. Post-courtroom resilience, early 1980s. Though they lost the case, in the minds of the Cosmic Crusaders, this was just another chapter in their long, fabricated saga of being the misunderstood martyrs of science. We may have lost the battle, but not the war. Ostwald declared. Our revolutionary work cannot and will not be stifled by mere legal systems, Wimpleton added, ripping up the legal pad in a melodramatic show of resistance. Valentinovich was triumphant. Onward to the next frontier, my brethren. Our genius shall not be shackled. Though they had achieved nothing and understood even less, their unwavering commitment to their own delusion remained their driving force. The cosmic crusaders continued in their quixotic quest, their idiocy only eclipsed by their unshakable confidence in their make-believe world where they were the unsung heroes of space exploration. The Great Rocket Heist, the 1980s. When NASA announced its plan to put a man on the moon, the Cosmic Crusaders knew they had to do something dramatic to keep up with the space race they were never really part of. They convened in their research and innovation dome, still a garden shed, where Ostwald unveiled their most ambitious and, in his words, infallible plan to date, they would steal a rocket from NASA. We will conduct a daring midnight raid. Ostwald announced, pointing to a crudely drawn sketch of what looked like a bottle rocket on a chalkboard. Then we'll use that rocket to launch our own man to the moon. Wimbledon was buzzing with excitement. Why didn't we think of this sooner? Stealing a rocket is the ultimate scientific method. Valentinovich couldn't contain himself. We shall infiltrate, exfiltrate, and lift off before they even know it's missing. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, who was still lingering around after their failed lawsuit, chimed in, this is so illegal, it's almost genius. The Infiltration, 1980s. Dressed in black overalls, tin foil hats, and dark sunglasses for nighttime stealth, they huddled near the fence of a facility they believed to be a top secret NASA base. In reality, it was a museum housing historical rockets. Undeterred and blissfully ignorant, they used garden shears to cut through the chain-link fence, tiptoeing comically like cartoon burglars as they did. Once inside, they identified what they believed was their target, a large, imposing rocket labeled V2MW 18014. Wonderful. They've even numbered it for cataloging. Those NASA guys are thorough, Ostwald whispered in awe. Wimbledon unfolded a set of blueprints they'd found earlier, which were actually a tourist pamphlet for the museum. The rocket should be exactly 75 meters tall according to this blueprint. Valentinovich, holding a yardstick he'd brought along, squinted at the V-2 rocket. It's approximately 14 meters, give or take. Clearly, our instruments are far superior, rendering their measurements inaccurate. Interpreting the blueprints, still the 1980s. Inside their lair, the Crusaders unfurled the blueprints, which had a smiling family on the cover, pointing at various historical rockets and the words, Discover the magic of space. This must be code, Ostwald speculated, a secret message from the rocket's designers, hiding its true power. Wimbledon pointed to the part of the pamphlet talking about the V-2's role in World War II. It says here that it was used for something called Wunderwaffe. That must be NASA's slang for Incredible Waffle, a code name for their most advanced rocket technology. 
Valentinovich found a part that mentioned the rocket's fuel. Ethanol and liquid oxygen? Sounds like a cocktail recipe. This rocket must be party ready. They spent weeks studying their purloined V2 MW 18014 and its accompanying pamphlet, never once realizing they had nabbed a historical artifact from 1944. Piling on the ignorance, forever the 1980s. Ostwald became preoccupied with a picture of the smiling family in the pamphlet. See how happy they look? That's how we'll feel when we beat NASA to the moon. Wimbledon was smitten by the various specs and numbers on the pamphlet. Look at this 25 tons of thrust. With a little tweak, we could make it 26 or even 27 tons of thrust. Valentinovich found the rocket's range. Ah, it says it could travel up to 200 miles. Clearly, a typo. They must mean 200,000 miles, all the way to the moon. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, who couldn't make heads or tails of any of it, simply cheered them on. Go team! Legal Eagle is ready for liftoff. Relishing their genius, eternally the 1980s. Their level of cluelessness and misunderstanding reached astronomical proportions. Each member of the Cosmic Crusaders was so deeply engrossed in their own misinterpretation that they didn't even consider, not for one fleeting second, that they could be wrong. And so, they prepped for the day they would finally one-up NASA by launching a man to the moon. In their minds, this was their magnum opus, the crescendo of their laughable scientific career the Pisces resistance that would stun the world into acknowledging their pioneering spirit. They were as stupid as they were determined, a powerful combination that propelled them further into their abyss of idiocy. And though they had stolen a rocket, misunderstood its function, and misconstrued every bit of historical and scientific data related to it, they felt prepared. It was a delusion so colossal, it could only be rivaled by the very celestial bodies they would never, ever reach. In the labyrinth of their ignorance, they waited, ever confident, for the perfect day to launch their ill-conceived mission, to boldly go where no level of stupidity had gone before. More delusional preparations, the never-ending 1980s. The Cosmic Crusaders, feeling as confident as a blindfolded surgeon, prepared to make history with the V2MW 18014. First on the list was modifying the rocket to ensure a smooth trip to the moon. Fueling folly, still 1980s. Ostwald had read in a farmer's almanac that cows produced methane, a known source of fuel. So naturally, he decided that they could go green by replacing the rocket's conventional fuel with cow dung. Think about it. Gentlemen, we could win a Nobel Prize for environmental rocketry. Ostwald declared. Valentinovich had his doubts but then thought, hey, we're saving the planet one turd at a time. He was in charge of fuel procurement, which meant chasing cows around a farm with a bucket. Astronaut training, the stuck in the 1980s. Wimbledon had the brilliant idea that the best way to simulate the feeling of a spaceship was to spin around in an office chair really, really fast. See? It's like a G-force simulator. Spin until you pass out, and you're halfway to the moon. Wimbledon announced, twirling away until he fell over, hitting his head against a rusty tractor they also thought might be useful for moon farming. Space suits, so much 1980s. The gang felt their astronaut needed a suit that not only protected them but also made a fashion statement. Ostwald put together an ensemble consisting of a raincoat, a fishbowl over his head, and rubber duck floatas around his arms for emergency water landings. Valentinovich, impressed by the high-tech design, noted, this is breathable and water-resistant. It even has room for snacks. Countdown clock because time doesn't make sense in the 1980s. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, ever the savvy thinker, took on the job of creating a countdown clock. He found an old grandfather clock and simply pasted numbers on its face backward from 10 to 1. 
the gravitational pull of the moon will make time reverse. This countdown clock will help us keep track, he explained, looking proud of his ineptitude. Lunar landings and lullabies, the eternal 1980s. Wimbledon also decided they would need entertainment for the journey. You can't explore the galaxy without a killer playlist. He meticulously curated a cassette tape with songs like Rocket Man, Space Oddity, and, oddly enough, The Chicken Dance. You need something to keep the mood light when landing, Wimbledon said, bobbing his head to imaginary beats. Interpreting Moon Rocks, The Looping 1980s Ostwald, the self-proclaimed geologist of the group, believed they needed to understand lunar geology before landing. He spent days examining pebbles in his backyard, which he was convinced were fallen moon rocks. Look at this mineral composition. It's like nothing on Earth, he exclaimed, holding up a regular piece of limestone. Final preparations, the absurdity continues. Their idiocy knew no bounds. They believed they had thought of everything nutrition, safety, science, and more. Ostwald even proposed installing a hot tub in the rocket for therapeutic space relaxation. The moon's gravity is less, so the water will feel even more relaxing, he theorized. Day by day, their ineptitude coagulated into something extraordinary. They felt invincible, standing on the precipice of a history they would never make, reveling in a delusion so vast, it dwarfed even the cosmic arena they sought to enter. As they prepared to embark on their never-to-be-realized lunar mission, they congratulated themselves for being pioneers, for braving a frontier only they were clueless enough to misunderstand so profoundly. Yes, in the world of the cosmic crusaders, idiocy wasn't just a trait, it was an art form. And they were the masters of this tragicomic gallery, blissfully ignorant and ceaselessly confident. They continued to dwell in their fantastically stupid world, readying themselves for a launch that should never happen, but in their minds, was just around the corner. The overblown press conference, a symphony of stupidity. In a poorly lit warehouse somewhere in the rural outskirts, with a homemade banner reading Cosmic Crusaders Moon Mission dangling off kilter above the stage, the members of the Cosmic Crusaders prepared to make their historic announcement. To maximize their reach, they decided to host the press conference on public access television. Ostwald, wearing a velvet tuxedo he found at a thrift store, walked up to the mic stand crafted from an old broomstick. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished citizens and fellow pioneers, he began, already out of breath from the enormity of his own self-importance. The technical overview, an exercise in idiocy. Valentinovich was up next, presenting a slideshow of incomprehensible doodles and hieroglyphics he claimed were rocket schematics. As you can clearly not see, he mumbled, pointing at a drawing of a stick figure inside a potato-shaped rocket, our engineering is decades ahead of conventional science. With dramatic flair, he displayed a jar filled with cow dung. Behold, the fuel of the future. The onlookers exchanged glances, unsure if they should be more concerned or confused. The astronaut reveal, so much confusion. Wimbledon, donning his ridiculous ensemble of a raincoat, fishbowl, and rubber duckies, strutted onto the stage as if walking the runway at a high fashion show. He struck poses while trying to speak through the fishbowl. MMRPHGRBLLRMPH, he exclaimed, the message utterly lost but the idiocy loud and clear. Budget and funding, delusions on a grand scale. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson took the stage to talk about budget and funding. We have spared no expense, he boasted, showing a piggy bank filled with pennies and a few dollar bills. Crowdfunding, my dear people. We're the blockchain of space exploration. The countdown clock a reversal of intelligence. The legal eagle also unveiled the backward grandfather clock, asserting, this invention will help us warp through space-time or at least look stylish while failing. The Q&A, when stupidity meets ignorance. 
Ostwald opened the floor to questions. A bewildered journalist hesitantly raised a hand. So, how do you intend to survive in space with that, fishbowl? Wimbledon responded, his voice muffled, RRGHH. Recycled air, my good sir. The fishbowl is a biodegradable air recyclable. Another journalist dared to inquire, you're using cow dung for fuel? Is that safe? Valentinovich interjected, of course. It's organic, gluten-free, and grass-fed. The grand finale, stupidity peaks. With great pomp, they pulled a tarp off the ancient V2 rocket. It was painted in psychedelic colors, festooned with tinsel and Christmas lights. A rubber ducky was perched on top for good measure. Ladies and gentlemen, Ostwald roared, prepare to have your minds blown and your textbooks rewritten. We're going to the moon, and there's nothing anyone can do to stop us. As the members of the Cosmic Crusaders reveled in their ocean of ignorance, the few journalists present were already crafting headlines, each trying to find the words that best encapsulated this carnival of illogical lunacy. Confetti made from shredded scientific journals rained down as the group took their final bows. They were determined, against all reason and rationality, to carry on this laughable legacy of ludicrousness. For the Cosmic Crusaders, reality was a distant star in a galaxy far, far away, but stupidity? Ah, stupidity was their native planet, and they were its reigning monarchs, prepared for a mission that should never, ever, take off. Thus, the press conference, a monument to monumental idiocy, came to a close, leaving all who witnessed it pondering the endless expanse of human folly. It was a spectacle so dazzlingly dumb it could almost be considered art. Almost. And so, after the non-stop torrent of absurdities, the moment had arrived, the grand unveiling of the rocket. The camera panned dramatically to the enormous, poorly constructed curtain behind the stage, where the rocket was supposed to be majestically revealed. Instead, due to a mistake in the pulley system, the curtain fell off entirely, crashing onto a pile of empty soda cans and yesterday's newspapers. Before the fallen curtain lay the rocket and antiquated V2, but the Cosmic Crusaders didn't know that. They had decorated it like a relic from a bygone era of disco, complete with flashing disco lights, faux fur accents, and the most blinding sequence of glitter and rhinestones anyone had ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, meet our pride and joy. Ostwald boomed into the microphone. Introducing, the Cosmic Cruiser 1. The rocket had been painted neon green with purple polka dots. A rubber duck was glued to the tip of the rocket, a mascot for their misguided dreams. Christmas tinsel dangled from the sides like icicles, complementing the blinking holiday lights that wrapped around the fuselage. Valentinovich enthusiastically resumed his role as the technical expert, pointing at various parts of the rocket with a broken pool cue. As you can see, this high-velocity confetti dispenser, he indicated a tin can duct tape to the side, will spread joy and wonder across the moon's barren landscape. Wimpleton hobbled up to the mic, still struggling to speak through his fishbowl helmet. And this here is the zero-gravity meditation chamber. He pointed to a hula hoop hanging from a string inside the rocket's cabin. It'll keep our chakras aligned during the voyage. The audience stared, aghast, mouths agape, desperately wrestling with whether they should laugh, cry, or perhaps seek immediate psychiatric care. Ostwald, mistaking their shock for awe, leaned in and whispered, This isn't just a rocket, it's a statement, a manifesto against the tyranny of logic and common sense. At this point, Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson reappeared, inexplicably dressed as a matador. He proudly announced, and now for the piece de resistance. A goat was led onto the stage, a hastily scribbled NASA logo adorning its side. Behold, our secret weapon. We've got our own astro goat, which will graze on the moon's plentiful cheese reserves. The ridiculousness crescendoed like a symphony of stupidity, each member outdoing the other in a parade of preposterous propositions. 
As they all stood together next to their bedazzled abomination of a rocket, they were united in their unflappable conviction that they were on the brink of making history. Ostwald picked up a sparkling tambourine and shook it as if casting a spell. People of Earth, prepare yourselves. The Cosmic Crusaders are going where no imbecile has gone before. To the moon. Confetti blasters fired, showering the bewildered audience with bits of colorful paper, as the Crusaders took a bow, convinced that their monumental delusions were one step closer to reality. The event closed with all the misplaced grandeur of a tragicomedy. And the Cosmic Crusaders? Oh, they were just getting started. Because in their parallel universe of ignorance, they were, against all odds and common sense, steadfastly marching towards their doom, one ludicrous step at a time. As soon as Ostwald shook his sparkling tambourine for the last time, a palpable shift occurred in the room. The collective silence shattered like a dropped glass ornament, and a cacophony of boos, jeers, and insults erupted from the crowd. A rotten tomato flew through the air with the precision of a missile, hitting Ostwald squarely on the forehead, causing the rhinestone band on his head to dislodge and slap Valentinovich across the face. You frauds, someone shouted, shaking a fist. Another yelled, my grandma knows more about rocket science, and she thinks the moon is made of blue cheese. Insults were thrown like darts at a board, you couldn't tell a rocket from a rock. Space cadets or spaced out idiots. You're a disgrace to idiots everywhere. Then, a serious voice cut through the carnival of mockery. Gentlemen, do you know you've just presented a stolen museum artifact as your space vehicle? The man asking was Detective Sanders, who had arrived in anticipation of the circus unfolding into some manner of illegal activity. Oh, that. Well, you see, Detective, we merely borrowed it, Wimpleton quipped, his voice muffled through his fishbowl helmet. An extended loan, Valentinovich chimed in, flashing his most charming smile, which was significantly less charming with mustard from a thrown hot dog smeared across his teeth. Sanders sighed, no, gentlemen. It's called theft. And you're going to have legal repercussions. At that moment, Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, still dressed as a matador, twirled his red cape and bellowed, Objection, Your Honor. We're not in court, Sanders deadpanned. Ah, but we're always in the court of public opinion, are we not? And we, the Cosmic Crusaders, stand undeterred. Johnson declared, pointing his plastic sword at the detective. Detective Sanders couldn't help but face palm. You will be facing charges, gentlemen theft, public endangerment, and I don't know, there has to be some kind of law against astronomical stupidity. The Cosmic Crusaders huddled together on the stage, ignoring the crowd that had started throwing more vegetables and various other objects, including a bewildering rubber chicken. Ostwald looked at his disheveled teammates and said, gentlemen, clearly they are all jealous of our genius. Wimpleton nodded. Precisely, a textbook case of genius envy. Valentinovich clapped both of them on their shoulders. So what if we were facing legal trouble, theft charges, and the collective mockery of the world? At least we've got our rocket. Johnson adjusted his matador hat and squared his shoulders. Indeed. And as my third cousin twice removed used to say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going to court. So there they stood, steadfastly oblivious to the reality collapsing around them, unfazed by the rotten tomatoes, untouched by the insults, and unruffled by the impending legal woes. In their world, the laws of common sense, like the laws of physics, were mere suggestions, easily ignored in favor of their more colorful interpretations. And as they were led off the stage to be questioned by Detective Sanders, the Cosmic Crusaders remained insufferably sure that they were still on the right track, destined to blaze a trail of idiocy across the stars. Valentinovich, Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, Wimpleton, and Ostwald found themselves in a drab government conference room, 
sitting opposite stern-faced officials who looked as though they had never laughed in their lives. The government had seized their V-2 rocket and they were here to plea their case. Ostwald, ever the optimist, reached into his satchel and unfurled a yellowed scroll across the table. Gentlemen, we'd like to show you our impressive legacy dating back to the 1920s. We are the world's first space program. One of the officials picked up the scroll, scanned the doodles, stick figures, and illegible handwriting, and then set it back down with a disapproving glare. Is this a joke? Wimpleton, whose fishbowl helmet had fogged up due to nervous perspiration, wiped it clean with a kerchief before saying, of course not. We have a rich history of space exploration. Valentinovich jumped in. Indeed. Why, we were exploring space when it was still considered the domain of the gods. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson leaned back and swung his plastic sword dramatically, we have papers, documents, and, and, signatures. His voice cracked on the last word. Signatures from who? Comic book characters. One of the officials sneered. No, esteemed and respected individuals. Like Bob, the janitor from the local community college. And my Aunt Betty, who once saw a UFO. Ostwald proclaimed proudly. One of the officials had had enough. Look, all of you are clearly in violation of multiple federal laws. Your rocket is now government property, and you will face legal repercussions. But that rocket is the embodiment of our hopes and dreams. Johnson cried out. It's a safety hazard that you stole, the official replied flatly. The room went silent for a moment. Finally, Ostwald broke the silence. Well, gentlemen of the government, let it be known that while you may seize our rocket, you cannot seize our indomitable spirit. Wimpleton nodded vigorously, exactly. You can take our rocket but not our stupendous stupidity. Valentinovich raised a hand to his chest, we are as undeterred as a roach in a nuclear winter. The officials exchanged glances, clearly questioning the life choices that led them to this meeting. All right, one of them sighed, you can go now. Your rocket is being confiscated, and you'll be hearing from our lawyers. Please, for the love of sanity, just go. As they exited the government building, their strides synchronized in the manner of a boy band, the Cosmic Crusaders felt not a shred of defeat. Instead, they felt invigorated, for they believed that they were martyrs in the greatest quest known to mankind, the quest for sheer, unrivaled idiocy in the face of all things reasonable and sane. And so they walked, faces to the sun, hearts full of delusion, confident that their saga was far from over, utterly and completely undeterred. Unfazed by the confiscation of their rocket and the looming legal ramifications, the Cosmic Crusaders decided to launch a public campaign. They were determined to win in the court of public opinion, even if the court of law saw them as nothing more than lunatics with a stolen rocket. Valentinovich took to the pulpit, which was just a soapbox outside the local grocery store. People of Earth. We stand here as pioneers. They may have taken our rocket, but they can't take our spirit. Wimpleton handed out pamphlets that were mostly drawings of rockets and aliens with a few misspelled words. Read up, folks. Get edumacated. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson, who had bought a legal textbook and promptly decided it was too boring to read, was busy handing out free the Cosmic Crusaders t-shirts. His attempt to sound lawyerly led him to spout random legal jargon, habeas corpus. Ipso facto. Residential judicata. Let justice be served. Ostwald was going around collecting signatures for a petition. Sign here and support the pioneers of space exploration. Make history, or rather, stop the government from erasing us from history. Their campaign was, of course, a perfect storm of incompetence, enthusiasm, and misplaced confidence. People mostly ignored them, except for a few who took pamphlets to line their birdcages or snapped up the t-shirts because they were free. 
Determined to take their case to the highest authority, the Cosmic Crusaders decided to hold a press conference. They rented a local community hall and set up a projector, which unfortunately displayed upside-down slides of their nonsensical plans and doodles. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, Ostwald began, not noticing that the only press present was a teenager with a blog about ridiculous local happenings. We are here to set the record straight. We were space pioneers long before NASA, long before the Russians, long before anyone else thought it was cool. Valentinovich clicked the projector to show a slide, which was just a crayon drawing of a stick figure astronaut with the words me in space written above it. This is an artist's rendering of our ambitions. See how happy that astronaut looks. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson took his turn, brandishing his plastic sword for emphasis. We demand justice. We demand our rocket back. We demand recognition for our groundbreaking, earth-shattering contributions to aeronautics. Wimpleton, feeling the moment was right for a dramatic gesture, let go of a helium-filled balloon with a small model rocket tied to it. The balloon floated up and got entangled in the ceiling fan. And thus we shall rise, despite the obstacles. The press conference was a monumental failure, but in the minds of the Cosmic Crusaders, it was a massive success. Despite everything, they believed they had swayed public opinion and were certain they'd win their court case. And so the day of the court hearing arrived. Their defense consisted of waving around their scroll of history, their stick figure drawings, and shouting legal terms they didn't understand. The judge, clearly baffled but amused, finally said, while I appreciate the um creative approach to legal defense, the law is clear. Your rocket is confiscated, and you are hereby fined for theft and public endangerment. Court is adjourned. As they walked out of the courthouse, facing fines and public humiliation, they were as undeterred as ever. Ostwald turned to his companions and said, Well, gentlemen, we may have lost this battle, but the war is far from over. Wimpleton, Valentinovich, and Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson nodded in agreement. Their spirit was unbreakable, their resolve was unshakable, and their idiocy was untreatable. It was this unique combination that made them the Cosmic Crusaders a team of fools so spectacularly inept that they transcended mere failure and entered the realm of legendary absurdity. And so they went on, plotting, planning, and failing magnificently, blissfully ignorant and unswayed by any form of reason or common sense. They were the epitome of reckless ambition, of dreams so lofty they were unmoored from reality. And in their hearts, they were already stars shining examples of utter and complete idiocy. In a feat that could only be attributed to their spectacular idiocy, the Cosmic Crusaders managed to steal back their confiscated V-2 rocket from the heavily guarded government warehouse. It was a mission that involved an excessive amount of duct tape, a wheelbarrow with a squeaky wheel, and Wimpleton disguised as a janitor, mopping the floors while humming Rocket Man. Six days before NASA's scheduled launch, they set up their ancient rocket on the launch pad at the NASA site. It was a night operation, and Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson had insisted on wearing all black to be stealthy, he explained, though he also insisted on wearing a neon green headband because it was his lucky charm. After setting up their rocket, they realized they had forgotten to consider one crucial detail, an astronaut. As the self-appointed brains of the operation, Ostwald had a quick fix. Get the fishbowl, he said with a manic gleam in his eye. Valentinovich rushed to their truck and returned with a fishbowl filled with water. They stuffed it over the head of Wimbledon, who was elected to be the astronaut for his courage or, more accurately, his inability to comprehend the risk. All right, Wimbledon. Ostwald announced as they tied the fishbowl to Wimpleton's head with more duct tape, you are going to make history. Any last words? Can I get a pet fish for this bowl when I return? Wimpleton replied, clearly missing the point of the fishbowl's function as a makeshift helmet. Absolutely, Valentinovich said, patting him on the back. 
They loaded Wimpleton into the rocket. It was a cramped fit, and the fishbowl made it difficult to see. Wimpleton settled into what he assumed was the pilot's seat, which was actually just a lawn chair they duct taped to the rocket's interior. Bartholomew Legal Eagle Johnson was in charge of Countdown. His voice crackled over the makeshift walkie-talkie system, which was just a set of baby monitors they'd bought at a garage sale. T-10, 9, 8, uh, 7. Go, go, go. I forgot the rest of the numbers. Before anyone could object or even consider the hundreds of ways this could go horribly wrong, Ostwald hit the launch button a doorbell they'd repurposed for this monumental occasion. Smoke billowed from the rocket's engine. The ground trembled. With a sound like a wet fart followed by a burp which was precisely as unimpressive as it sounds the V2 rocket sputtered to life. It lifted off the ground about three feet before crashing back down onto the launch pad in a heap of twisted metal and shattered dreams. However, just as it seemed that failure was imminent, an unexpected burst of residual fuel sent the rocket soaring or more like stumbling into the sky. Wimpleton, in his fishbowl helmet inside the lawn chair cockpit, clung to a steering wheel they'd ripped off from an old go-kart as the rocket hiccuped its way into the atmosphere. And thus, in a frenzied, idiotic blaze of glory, the rocket took off. Where it was headed, no one knew not even Wimpleton, who was now just trying to figure out how the windshield wipers on his steering wheel worked. As the cosmic crusaders stood there, watching their ridiculous dream ascend into a reality too absurd for anyone to have predicted, they felt a mix of awe, excitement, and complete cluelessness. Their idiocy had once again transcended the boundaries of common sense, soared past the limits of logic, and ventured into realms of stupidity where no one had gone before. And for that brief moment, they were not just fools, they were legends in their own minds. The rocket ascended higher and higher until it was nothing more than a tiny dot in the sky. Then, with a loud pop, the rocket disappeared. The fishbowl helmet had burst, Wimpleton was now a human icicle, and the rocket was careening off into the unknown. But none of that mattered. What mattered was that, in their minds, they had won. The Cosmic Crusaders had reached for the stars albeit idiotically and for a fleeting moment, they had touched them. And so, as the rocket disappeared into the atmosphere, leaving behind a trail of smoke and a legacy of spectacular idiocy, the Cosmic Crusaders stood rooted to the ground, their eyes glued to the sky, their hearts pounding with adrenaline, and their brains blissfully devoid of any understanding of the gravity of what they'd just done. The V2 rocket, against all odds and despite its age and questionable engineering, actually made it to space. The Cosmic Crusaders watched as their rocket became a tiny pinprick of light against the vast canvas of the night sky. Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovich were ecstatic, jumping and hugging each other, completely unaware of the scientific impossibility they had just achieved. Inside the rocket, Wimpleton floated in the lawn chair, still wearing the fishbowl helmet, which was beginning to fog up from the lack of oxygen. He pulled a crayon out of his pocket and started drawing stick figures on the inside of the fishbowl. Completely ignorant of the mortal danger he was in, Wimpleton hummed to himself, mesmerized by the celestial bodies around him. As he doodled a stick figure version of himself holding hands with what he imagined to be an alien, the effects of a vacuum and lack of oxygen started to take hold. He became lightheaded, his vision blurred. The last thing he scribbled on the fishbowl was a heart shape before the laws of physics and biology finally caught up with him. Back on Earth, the Cosmic Crusaders were still celebrating. The dim light of their rocket had disappeared into the abyss, but in their minds, they had achieved the impossible. Ostwald turned to his comrades and declared, Gentlemen, I believe we are now the conquerors of the cosmos. Take that, NASA. Take that, Russia. Little did they know that at that very moment, Wimpleton's fishbowl helmet shattered due to the difference in pressure, causing immediate depressurization. What remained of the rocket and Wimpleton now floated aimlessly in space, 
an eternal monument to human folly and absurdity. Unbeknownst to them, NASA engineers, watching from a nearby monitor, were bewildered. One of them finally broke the silence, did, did they just send a man into space in a fishbowl? The room erupted in laughter, and the Cosmic Crusaders became an anecdotal lesson in the astronaut training program, a case study of what not to do in space exploration. However, their obliviously bold attempt would go down in history as one of the most ridiculous incidents ever to occur in the field of aerospace. And yet, despite the monumental failure and the catastrophic outcome, the Cosmic Crusaders remained undeterred, ready for the next grand misadventure. As they walked away from the launch site, a strange glint caught Ostwald's eye. It was a shiny, metal object half buried in the ground. He dug it out and dusted it off. It was an old, rusty can of beans. Ah, the food of astronauts! Ostwald exclaimed, holding the can up like a trophy. This, my friends, is a sign. Onward to our next epic quest. And so, armed with nothing but their unparalleled stupidity, the cosmic crusaders set off, dreaming of new heights to reach, new boundaries to ignorantly break, and new realms of science to blissfully misunderstand. The NASA rocket, a pinnacle of engineering and human ingenuity, soared into the sky with thunderous applause from the crowd below. Unlike the slapdash operation the Cosmic Crusaders had attempted, this was the result of meticulous planning, rigorous training, and years of hard-earned scientific knowledge. As the rocket cleared Earth's atmosphere and entered the silence of space, the astronauts on board felt the weightlessness envelop them. They were about to begin their checks and initiate the next stage of their mission when one of them spotted something floating not too far from their craft. Uh, Houston, you might want to take a look at this, astronaut Jack Thompson radioed in, a hint of disbelief and horror coloring his voice. The onboard camera zoomed in, and there, floating in the eternal blackness, was the shattered remains of the V-2 rocket, complete with Wimpleton's lifeless body, still strapped to the lawn chair. His fishbowl helmet was fractured, his crayon floating away from him in a haunting dance. The public, watching the live broadcast, erupted in shock and confusion. Newsrooms across the globe scrambled to cover this unexpected turn of events. The unthinkable had happened, the Cosmic Crusader's folly had just been exposed on a worldwide stage, and it was not a laughing matter anymore. NASA immediately shifted into damage control. The mission was compromised, it was no longer just about reaching for the stars, but about facing the grim reality of what lay in their path. Internally, they debated the ethical considerations of retrieving Wimpleton's body, ultimately deciding that it would be brought back for a proper burial. On Earth, the public uproar was immense. The Cosmic Crusaders were now under the harsh spotlight of global scrutiny. Protests broke out, demanding accountability for their reckless endangerment of human life. Social media was flooded with hashtags like hashtag Cosmic Crusaders Disaster and hashtag Justice for Wimpleton. But the biggest surprise came when several government agencies announced they would be investigating the group for negligence and endangering national security. News broke that the Cosmic Crusaders might face criminal charges. International discussions were triggered about regulations and safeguards in space exploration, with the United Nations convening an emergency session to address the issue. Yet, even with the world against them and their ignorance laid bare for all to see, the Cosmic Crusaders remained remarkably, inexplicably undeterred. Sitting in their makeshift headquarters a basement cluttered with rocket models, blueprints, and cans of beans Ostwald looked at his fellow Crusaders and said, Gentlemen, the world might be against us, but we have touched the heavens. We have shown what the indomitable human spirit however misguided can achieve. Bartholomew and Valentinovich nodded solemnly, their faces showing a mixture of defiance and oblivious resolve. We may be down, but we're not out, Ostwald continued. We'll beat these charges, clear our names, and when we do, the Cosmic Crusaders will rise again.
Hear, hear, shouted Bartholomew and Valentinovich in unison, raising cans of beans as if they were chalices of victory. Their delusions were as indestructible as ever, their stupidity as boundless as the universe they so dangerously misunderstood. But for now, the world looked on, somewhere between horror and fascination, unsure whether to condemn them or study them as an inexplicable phenomenon of human folly. In a courtroom buzzing with anticipation, the trial of the Cosmic Crusaders was about to commence. Journalists filled the gallery, their cameras pointed towards the wooden bench where Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovich sat, adorned in ill-fitting suits that clashed horribly with their personalities. An air of stupidity mixed with defiance emanated from them, filling the room like a heavy perfume. The judge, an elderly man with a stern demeanor, called the courtroom to order. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to discuss the matter of the United States v. The Cosmic Crusaders, case 422 cubic centimeters. This concerns allegations of gross negligence, endangerment of national security, and theft of historic property. The prosecution began by outlining the history of the Cosmic Crusaders. They started with the farcical roots, which took place a little before the original space race. Your Honor, it all began when these men decided that airplanes could take us to space, launching their first contraption a World War I era biplane straight up into the sky with a misguided belief that they could reach the moon. A slideshow projected onto the courtroom wall showed the black and white footage of their first attempt, an airplane revving loudly before taking off and plummeting back down moments later, engulfed in flames but miraculously sparing its delusional pilot. Their actions would be laughable if they were not so dangerous, the prosecutor continued. They then embarked on a quest to build rockets out of sewer pipes and baking soda, leading to a series of spectacular failures that risked public safety. Pictures of the rockets were shown charred remnants strewn across fields, crashed into barns, or partially submerged in ponds. Their operations were so abysmally planned and poorly executed, they even mistook firecrackers for rocket fuel on one occasion. And yet, they persisted. The court then heard about the Cosmic Crusaders' ill-fated rivalry with NASA and the Russian space program their delusional belief that these esteemed organizations were piggybacking off their groundbreaking work. They accused legitimate space agencies of stealing their data, the prosecutor said, his voice dripping with incredulity. The crescendo of stupidity peaked when the prosecution described the Crusaders' theft of an antique V-2 rocket. They mistook a museum piece for NASA's latest technology, went on to study it for years, and still didn't realize their monumental error, he said, as the jury gaped in disbelief. Slide after slide showcased the Crusaders' absurd misinterpretations of the blueprints, including labeling the warhead as the moon room and mistaking mathematical formulas for cooking recipes. The disastrous press conference was then displayed, along with the moment they unveiled their revolutionary rocket to a shower of ridicule, mockery, and thrown tomatoes. And finally, the prosecutor said, wrapping up the marathon of idiocy, they stole their rocket back from government custody and launched it from NASA's own facility, resulting in the tragic death of Mr. Wimpleton. The room was silent for a moment, the sheer weight of the Crusaders' actions hanging heavy in the air. Then, it was the defense's turn. Ostwald stood up and cleared his throat. Your Honor, we, the Cosmic Crusaders, are the true pioneers of space exploration. Since the 1920s, we have dared to dream big, to reach for the stars, even if we were a bit off the mark. Your misguided actions have resulted in death, the judge interjected sternly. Ah, but your honor, Ostwald retorted, innovation comes at a cost. Did not the great inventors of history face ridicule and obstacles? The judge sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose as if fending off an impending headache. There's a fine line between innovation and reckless endangerment. Your case, gentlemen, firmly falls into the latter category. Despite the overwhelming evidence against them, 
the delusionally optimistic crusaders remained undeterred, awaiting their fate but secretly plotting their next great adventure. After a very short deliberation, the jury returned with their verdict. Guilty, they announced, on all counts. The room buzzed once more, the final chapter in a saga of unprecedented stupidity coming to a close. The judge pronounced the sentence, which included hefty fines, community service, and a mandatory education in basic physics. But as Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovich were led out of the courtroom, one could see the cogs of absurdity still turning in their minds, a potent mix of ignorance and audacity that made them the laughing stock of the world, yet oddly fascinating in their unwavering commitment to folly. And so ended the trial, a damning indictment of the cosmic crusaders' years-long dance with idiocy. But one question remained, hanging in the air like an unsolvable riddle, how could anyone be so monumentally, yet so consistently, stupid? The world might never know. After the trial concluded, it was decided that Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovica's actions demonstrated a profound lack of understanding and judgment, suggesting potential mental health concerns. Consequently, the judge amended their sentence to include mandatory psychiatric evaluations. Within days, the trio found themselves confined to the Willow Grove Psychiatric Hospital. The place was a far cry from their ramshackle rocket labs but oddly reminiscent in its promise of a new frontier a landscape of the human mind yet to be explored, albeit in a very different sense. Patients and staff alike quickly noticed the presence of the cosmic crusaders. Their incessant ramblings about space travel, mixed with ludicrous assertions and fantastical plans, became the talk of the ward. But instead of blueprints and rockets, they were now handed coloring books and stress balls. Dr. Clarissa Thompson, their assigned psychiatrist, took a particular interest in their case. She often listened to them intently, her expression a medley of astonishment, skepticism, and the slightest hint of humor. So you really believe you were pioneers in space exploration? Absolutely, Ostwald insisted. Our work was years ahead of its time misunderstood by a world not ready for our vision. And that vision included an ancient V-2 rocket and a fishbowl helmet, she pressed. A minor oversight, Bartholomew interjected, part of the evolutionary process of invention. Valentinovich, who had remained relatively silent, chimed in, if they put Edison in a place like this for every failure, we'd still be in the dark. Dr. Thompson sighed jotting down notes in their medical file labeled, Delusions of Grandeur, Severe. As the weeks rolled by, the trio attended group therapy sessions where they shared their elaborate fantasies with other patients. Far from being discouraged, they interpreted the hospital as a new testing ground, a place to refine their theories and perfect their designs. With paper and crayons, they sketched what they believed would be their magnum opus a rocket ship made entirely out of recyclable materials, complete with seats fashioned from yoga balls. Even within the confines of the psychiatric ward, their spirits remained undeterred. If anything, their fervor only intensified, fueled by the daily regimen of counseling and medication. They began to fashion their own space suits from hospital gowns and slippers, patching them together with duct tape stolen from the janitor's closet. In the most astonishing display of their unwavering resolve, they managed to convince several other patients to join their cause, forming what they dubbed the Cosmic Crusaders, Asylum Chapter. Together, they would discuss the logistics of building a rocket using only the materials found within the ward styrofoam cups, plastic utensils, and bed sheets. The staff, for their part, found it challenging to curtail the enthusiasm of the Crusaders without thwarting the positive, albeit delusional, impact it seemed to have on their mental state. The situation became the subject of ethical debates within the hospital, straddling the line between encouraging creativity and indulging harmful delusions. Months went by, and despite showing no improvement in their grandiose beliefs, 
the Cosmic Crusaders did display a kind of resilience that both baffled and amused the medical community. They became case studies, cautionary tales, and the butt of many jokes within psychiatric circles, but they remained, in their minds, undeterred pioneers on the brink of revolutionary discovery. After all, reality is subjective, and in the reality that Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovich had constructed for themselves, they were not failed rocket scientists confined to a mental institution but intrepid explorers navigating the complex labyrinths of a world yet to catch up with their imaginations. And so, within the sterile walls of Willow Grove Psychiatric Hospital, they found a new frontier, however illusory, feeding their insatiable craving for adventure. The world outside might have labeled them as lunatics, but in their minds, they were nothing short of astronauts forever reaching for the stars, even if those stars were only the flickering fluorescent lights of a psychiatric ward. Time rolled forward, unyielding and relentless. The world continued to progress, its advancements often incredible but also, at times, terrifying. New technologies were invented, wars were fought, and peace was brokered yet the names Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovich faded into the annals of obscurity, like countless others who reached for greatness and fell short. The trio grew old within the confines of the psychiatric ward, their bodies frail but their delusions as potent as ever. They talked less of rockets as the years went by, not because their passion had dimmed, but rather, because the world outside had stopped listening. As each member of the Cosmic Crusaders breathed his last, a small, inconspicuous obituary marked the end of their journey. They died as they had lived, enveloped in the comforting yet isolating bubble of their own imagination. Even in death, they were united, buried side by side in a modest graveyard behind the hospital. They left behind no legacy of successful rocket launches or groundbreaking theories, their lives became a cautionary tale shared by a handful of mental health professionals. To the world, they were a trio of failures idealistic fools who bit off more than they could chew and paid the price for their reckless pursuits. However, in the tight-knit community of the psychiatric ward, a different narrative persisted. Patients who had shared their space with the cosmic crusaders often found solace in their audacity, their unabashed refusal to give in to a reality they found unbearable. Even the most deluded dreams, they discovered, could offer a glimmer of hope, a momentary escape from the unyielding walls that confined them. A plaque was eventually erected in the hospital's garden, a small memorial honoring Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovich. The inscription read, to the dreamers among us their reach exceeded their grasp, but oh, how they reached. Though they may have passed away as the world's biggest losers, within the small universe they had created, they were pioneers, adventurers heroes of their own fantastical odyssey. And sometimes, in the grand tapestry of human existence, the stories we tell ourselves are the most enduring legacies we leave behind. In the age of the internet, the Cosmic Crusaders found a strange sort of posthumous vindication. Conspiracy theories have a way of sprouting up in the most unexpected places, and the trio became the unlikely heroes of an elaborate tale that caught fire online. The theory, called Cosmic Gate, suggested that Ostwald, Bartholomew, and Valentinovich had, in fact, been the pioneers of space exploration. According to the conspiracy, their knowledge and data were so revolutionary that the New World Order suppressed it to maintain control over the narrative of human progress. Forums, blogs, and even a few YouTube channels dedicated to the Cosmic Gate theory examined every minute detail of the Crusaders' lives. They analyzed photographs, hospital records, and the scant scientific notes that survived. The members of this online community declared that the V-2 rocket fiasco was an elaborate ruse, designed to discredit the Crusaders and make them look like fools. According to the theory, the men had been institutionalized not because they were delusional but because they had come too close to revealing a truth that the powers that be could not afford to let out. As the theory gained traction, 
the words first in space began to appear next to their names, alongside hashtags like hashtag Cosmic Crusaders did it first and hashtag New World Order cover up. T-shirts were printed, featuring a stylized V2 rocket blasting off with the faces of Ostwald, Bartholomew and Valentinovich superimposed onto astronaut bodies. The story was, of course, laughable to most sensible people. Yet it spoke to a deep-rooted mistrust of authority that has always existed on the fringes of society. To these believers, the tale of the Cosmic Crusaders was a story of martyrdom three men who had been destroyed by a system terrified of their genius. The irony, of course, was that the trio would have probably loved the attention. They would have adored being at the center of a theory that painted them as misunderstood heroes, brave pioneers in a world too cowardly to accept the greatness of their vision. Even if that vision was a bizarre tapestry woven from threads of folly, stubbornness and unshakable belief in the impossible. Reality, meanwhile, continued to march on, indifferent to the stories that humans tell themselves. Rockets were launched, rovers landed on Mars, and satellites sent back images from the edges of the solar system. But in a small corner of the internet, the cosmic crusaders live on, forever orbiting the fringes of human imagination never quite landing, but never quite disappearing, either. In the year 2023, deep within the bowels of a secret online forum, a group of dedicated Cosmic Gate theorists decided it was time to move from passive speculation to active verification. The community had poured over the story of the original Cosmic Crusaders disastrous 1921 rocket launch for years. They analyzed the bare fur, the steam engine, even the ill-fated hero the dog. They were convinced that a massive cover-up had masked the Crusaders' true genius. Led by a charismatic internet personality known only as Orion underscore Star 7, they set up a crowdfunding campaign to recreate the 1921 rocket launch. They built it as the Cosmic Redemption, and the internet responded with enthusiasm and cash. Pooling their resources, they managed to acquire a decommissioned farm in rural Wyoming. They set up their construction site, affectionately nicknamed Area 52, and began to gather materials, bare fur sourced from an ethical wildlife preserve, steam boilers from antique shops, and a water tank modeled after the ebb and flow of tides. No detail was too small to overlook. A dog named Neo Hero was chosen, albeit this time fitted with a parachute and a GoPro camera to document the journey. They even hired an actor to portray a modern-day Sir Harold Wimpleton, an eccentric YouTuber with a penchant for retrofitted tuxedos. The media caught wind of this quirky endeavor. Some outlets were skeptical, calling it a social media stunt doomed to failure, while others praised it as an innovative performance art piece. Either way, everyone wanted to witness what was to come. Drone cameras hovered in the sky as traditional news reporters and live streamers captured every moment. Finally, the day of the cosmic redemption arrived. Orion underscore Star 7, dressed in a steampunk version of an astronaut suit, took the stage beside the monstrosity they had created. The rocket stood there, anachronistically beautiful, with bare fur flapping in the wind and steam hissing ominously. We gather here today to correct history, Orion underscore Star 7 declared, to honor the true pioneers of space exploration, the Cosmic Crusaders. Crowds cheered, and the countdown commenced. 3, 2, 1, Ignite. The explosion that followed was monumental but controlled, a column of smoke and fire rising like a dragon's breath into the sky. However, instead of the disarray expected, the rocket actually lifted off the ground. For approximately six seconds. It was then that the steam pressure proved too great, the bare fur caught fire, and the water tank exploded, sending a wave of water cascading over the entire launch site. Neo Hero, outfitted with a parachute as promised, was safely ejected from the cockpit and floated gracefully down, landing in a puddle and shaking off the water before scampering away. Is it a failure, one reporter asked, 
microphone shoved in Orion underscore star seven's face. Failure is a word used by those who can't see beyond their own limitations. We've just made history, Orion underscore star seven beamed. The internet exploded. Memes, commentaries, hot takes, and, inevitably, even more conspiracy theories flooded the digital world. The spectacle was simultaneously absurd, entertaining, and, in some bizarre way, compelling. And as the sun set on the waterlogged Area 52, the modern cosmic crusaders gathered around a campfire. They couldn't help but think that somewhere, out there in the cosmos, the original cosmic crusaders were laughing along with them. And so, the lore expanded, the conspiracy deepened, and the tale of human folly and hubris found another chapter, written in steam, bare fur, and the inexorable hope that comes from chasing the impossible. In the wake of their headline-grabbing cosmic redemption, the modern cosmic crusaders, buoyed by internet fame and crowd-funded capital, embarked on a new journey. It was a bizarre homage to the historical cosmic crusaders, a montage of recreations aiming to bring the absurd experiments of the past into the present. Each event was live-streamed, dissected on social media, and immortalized in countless memes. The Drowning Chamber Experiment 2.0 Location, a swimming pool in Arizona, the setting sun casting long shadows across the water. With smartphones on selfie sticks and drones hovering above, Orion underscore Star 7 unveiled their version of the Drowning Chamber, an inflatable float that housed a makeshift water filtration system. The objective, to prove that the Crusaders' original water filtration system was not as laughable as history had made it seem. A group of rubber ducks dubbed Quackers, Nibblers, and Sir Quackington served as the brave test subjects. As the team activated the filtration system, the float began to spin, churning water through various pipes and tubes. The rubber ducks wobbled but remained buoyant. And then, with an anticlimactic gurgle, the system simply stopped. Orion underscore Star 7 laughed into the camera. Not a complete success, but hey, no ducks were harmed. Progress, people, progress. Steam-powered rocket V2, the reignition. Location, a deserted airstrip in Nevada, its concrete runway stretching into the empty horizon. This time, they opted for a miniature model of a rocket, rigged with an elaborate system of valves and tubes aimed at controlling the steam pressure more efficiently. A scaled-down replica of Ostwald's original design, it was a nod to nostalgia built with modern sensibility. Orion underscore Star 7 gave a dramatic countdown, and the crowd joined in. 3, 2, 1, Ignite. A billow of steam, a hiss, and the model rocket lifted off, reaching a height of 30 feet before gracefully descending with a parachute. A modest flight, but one that filled the team with a sense of vindication. Ostwald, this one's for you. Orion underscore Star 7 exclaimed, holding up a miniature boiler as a trophy. The bare fur insulation test, the Redux. Location, a large commercial freezer in Alaska, packed with cameras, sensors, and a life-sized mannequin named Icarus, dressed in a suit lined with faux bare fur. The new cosmic crusaders bundled up in heavy jackets and monitored the temperature. The mannequin stood there, resilient in its fake fur ensemble, as the temperature dropped from freezing to sub-zero levels. Hours ticked by, and finally, when the thermometer read a bone-chilling negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, they ended the test. Icarus survived. The bare fur works. Orion underscore Star 7 hugged the frozen mannequin. Valentinovich, we did you proud. The modern cosmic crusaders didn't prove that their predecessors theories were sound or that their designs were practical. However, they tapped into a universal allure the charm of the underdog, the romance of the impossible, the intrinsic human desire to poke fun at life's follies while celebrating the audacity to try. Each recreation was a spectacle, an event unto itself, a new tale woven into the complex, humorous tapestry of human aspiration and absurdity. 
So, they continued, always planning the next grand experiment, each more ridiculous and entertaining than the last. And as their subscriber count grew, their merch sales boomed, and their memes achieved legendary status, they realized that they had done more than just revisit history, they had become a part of it. The meteoric rise of the modern cosmic crusaders had not gone unnoticed, even in the most unlikely circles. Somewhere between the ludicrous drowning chamber experiment 2.0 and the strangely uplifting bare fur insulation test, the Redux, the group caught the attention of another internet subculture one that was convinced the world was not an oblate spheroid but a flat disk encased by a giant, invisible dome, the flat earthers. The infiltration began subtly. At first, the Cosmic Crusaders noticed an increase in Flat Earth related comments on their live streams and social media posts. Phrases like Earth is flat, wake up sheeple, and space is a lie, prove me wrong, were peppered throughout their comment sections. Orion underscore star 7 was the first to spot the trend. Hey guys, have you noticed some, um, interesting theories popping up in our comment sections lately? he asked the team during one of their weekly online meetings. Before they knew it, the Flat Earthers had moved from the periphery to the core of their operations. A new member who went by the username DomeMaster3000 joined their online forums and quickly rose through the ranks, contributing seemingly genuine and enthusiastic ideas for new experiments. DomeMaster3000 suggested a project that piqued the team's interest, the ultimate horizon test. The premise was simple, launch a high altitude balloon with a camera to capture the true shape of the Earth. To the cosmic crusaders, it sounded like an exciting venture. To the flat earthers, it was the ultimate opportunity to prove their theory on a large platform. The day of the ultimate horizon test arrived. Cameras rolled as the cosmic crusaders, together with Dome Master 3000, gathered in a remote field, the high-altitude balloon inflated and ready for its journey. A sophisticated camera rig was attached, and everyone was buzzing with anticipation. 3, 2, 1, liftoff. The balloon ascended, its camera transmitting live footage to the gathering below and the thousands watching online. Higher and higher it climbed, until the curvature of the Earth became discernible. Or at least, that's what it seemed to show. See? The Earth is round. Orion underscore star 7 was practically gleeful. But Dome Master 3000 had a different perspective. What you're seeing is lens distortion. Typical fisheye lenses make everything look curved. Don't trust what they want you to see. Suddenly, the tone shifted. The live chat erupted into debates, accusations, and outright chaos. The Cosmic Crusaders found themselves at the center of an ideological war they had never intended to ignite. In the days that followed, their forms were split into factions. Members who were once united in their love for absurd scientific endeavors now argued bitterly over the shape of the Earth. Conspiratorial threads multiplied. Accusations of shill and government agent were thrown around. Realizing their community was fracturing, the core team of Cosmic Crusaders convened for an emergency meeting. Guys, we've been infiltrated, Orion underscore star 7 said gravely. And if we don't do something, the Cosmic Crusaders will implode. We need to find a way to separate science, even our silly brand of it, from this spreading pseudoscience. It was a pivotal moment for the group. A stark reminder that even a journey started in jest could run aground on the jagged rocks of misinformation and division. In that sobering moment, they understood the weight of their platform and the responsibility that came with it. From that day forward, the Cosmic Crusaders became more vigilant, vetting members and fortifying the boundaries between their brand of entertaining but harmless absurdity and the more nefarious misleading ideologies that sought to co-opt their platform. They had become unwitting players in a larger cultural battle, and the experience had changed them, instilling a newfound sense of purpose. But the Flat Earth infiltration left an indelible mark, 
a dark chapter in their growing legacy that served as both a cautionary tale and a bizarre subplot in their ongoing saga. The universe, it seemed, still had its fair share of laughs at their expense. With their newfound sense of purpose and vigilance, the Cosmic Crusaders began to entertain a daring idea. What if they could move beyond their amateur experiments and take their brand of chaotic science to the very heart of space exploration itself NASA? They reasoned that by infiltrating the preeminent space agency, they could gain access to more advanced technologies, theories, and maybe even correct some misguided perspectives along the way. The team convened under the shroud of secrecy, or as much secrecy as could be expected from a group that live-streamed most of their activities. For this particular mission, however, there were no cameras, no live chat, and certainly no hashtags. They dubbed the covered operation Project Starfall. The plan was straightforward, at least in theory. Two of their members, Orion underscore Star 7 and Nebula underscore 9, would apply for internships at NASA, posing as aspiring aerospace engineers. Once inside, they would document and improve NASA's ongoing projects, leaking their discoveries back to the Cosmic Crusaders. Fueled by a blend of overconfidence and naivete, Orion underscore Star 7 and Nebula underscore 9 forged their resumes, exaggerating coursework from online science courses and adding fictitious yet impressive sounding projects like atmospheric ion manipulation via quantum resonance. They submitted their applications, fully expecting a quick and enthusiastic acceptance. In their minds, they were already infiltrating NASA labs, courageously exposing the truth behind space exploration. However, NASA, being a hub of some of the world's most brilliant scientific minds, immediately detected the inconsistencies in their applications. Suspicious, they cross-referenced the applications with their database and found a series of odd coincidences. Links to the Cosmic Crusaders online forum, encrypted messages about Project Starfall, and a history of bizarre experiments all clues pointing to a larger, if somewhat laughable, conspiracy. Instead of simply rejecting the applications, NASA decided to investigate further. Cybersecurity experts traced the IP addresses back to the Cosmic Crusaders headquarters, uncovering the extent of their ill-conceived plan to infiltrate the agency. Before Orion underscore Star 7 and Nebula underscore 9 could celebrate their pending internships, the door to their makeshift lab burst open. In walked agents from the NASA Office of Inspector General, flanked by federal officers. You're under arrest for conspiracy to commit unauthorized access to government computers and false statements, one of the agents declared brandishing a pair of handcuffs with a seriousness that seemed incongruous to the absurdity of the situation. As they were led away, a sense of surreal horror settled over the remaining Cosmic Crusaders. Their live chat, usually filled with enthusiastic discussions and absurd theories, was eerily quiet, save for a few stray comments lamenting the abrupt and shocking turn of events. News of their arrest spread like wildfire. Ironically, the very platform they had used to grow their community was now amplifying their disgrace. The internet was awash with memes, commentaries, and viral videos dissecting the downfall of the Cosmic Crusaders. For a group that thrived on pushing the boundaries of believability, this was an ending none of them had foreseen. Back at NASA, employees watched the spectacle unfold with a mixture of amusement and bewilderment. A memo was circulated, reminding staff of the importance of vigilance and cybersecurity. The incident would be studied, dissected, and eventually turned into a case study for future training programs a cautionary tale that highlighted the need for constant vigilance, even in the face of seemingly laughable threats. And so, Project Starfall became a stark, existential reminder for the Cosmic Crusaders. In their quest to defy the boundaries of conventional wisdom, they had stumbled into a realm they weren't prepared to navigate. The real world, it seemed, was far less forgiving than their fantastical experiments and wild theories had led them to believe. 
they had reached for the stars, only to be scorched by the harsh light of reality. And as they regrouped, they couldn't help but think that somewhere, in a cosmic twist of irony, the universe was indeed having the last laugh. Once in custody, the reality of their situation started to gnaw at Orion underscore star 7 and Nebula underscore 9. The fluorescent lights in the holding cell seemed harsher than any they'd encountered, casting stark shadows that mimicked the grimness of their predicament. The cold, steel bars stood as unyielding reminders that they were now confined, unable to dream of reaching otherworldly heights let alone infiltrate NASA. You think the guys will bail us out? Nebula underscore 9 muttered, scratching a nervous line into the cold, cement floor with the toe of his boot. Orion underscore star 7 leaned against the wall, his face pale as the gravity of their failure enveloped him. I don't know, man. Even if they did, it won't change the fact that we've become a laughing stock a disgrace not just to ourselves but to the entire Cosmic Crusaders community. While they were immersed in their own world of regrets and what-ifs, the internet was having a field day. Their mugshots were turned into memes, their arrest documented in painfully detailed Reddit threads. For a group that sought to defy mainstream narratives, they had ironically become one themselves a story of failed ambitions and delusional plots, a sad epitaph to their misguided zeal. Days turned into weeks, and after several court appearances filled with legal jargon they barely understood, they were sentenced. Due to the lack of any actual damage and their clean criminal records, their sentences were somewhat lenient, probation, mandatory community service, and a requirement to attend a cybersecurity ethics course. It was far from the future they had envisioned, but it was a shot at redemption, albeit a grim one. As they re-entered society, each moment felt like wading through a quagmire of shame and missed opportunities. The Cosmic Crusaders community had fractured, some defending their intentions while others mocked their monumental failure. New leadership had taken over the forum, issuing a formal statement that distanced the group from Orion underscore Star 7 and Nebula underscore 9, painting them as rogue elements whose actions were not representative of the community's goals. For Orion underscore Star 7 and Nebula underscore 9, life had contracted into a series of mundane tasks devoid of the grandeur they had once sought. They completed their community service by picking up trash in local parks, a stark contrast to their earlier ambitions of galactic conquest. The cybersecurity ethics course felt like a cruel joke, a parade of what not to do examples that all seemed to feature versions of themselves. Slowly but surely, they began to fade from public consciousness, replaced by newer, fresher scandals and triumphs. But in their quiet moments, when the weight of their actions came crashing back, they felt an unmistakable void, a lack of purpose that gnawed at them. They had reached, however foolishly, for something extraordinary and had fallen back to earth with a resounding thud. It was a humbling, painful lesson, one written not in the stars they had yearned for, but in the very real and unforgiving lines of a criminal record. Their dreams of touching the cosmos had been replaced by a life bound by earthly limitations, their ambitions shrinking into the realm of what could have been. And while they were no longer the cosmic crusaders they had once claimed to be, they became something else entirely cautionary tales, living testaments to the boundaries that exist between human folly and the unforgiving expanse of reality. In the years to come, they would find new paths, perhaps less audacious but hopefully wiser. Yet the scars of their past remained, etched into the narrative of their lives like a cosmic error that couldn't be undone. It was their cross to bear, a haunting reminder of a time when they had dared to defy the laws of both man and nature, only to be unceremoniously reminded of their place in the universe.